Today we are in conversation with Dr. Kogi Naidu, head of the HIV and tuberculosis treatment program at the Center for AIDS program of research in South Africa, which we more commonly know as CAPRISA. She is the lead scientist on many projects researching treatment for TB and HIV co-infected patients. Dr. Naidu, who lives in Durban, South Africa, is currently in India to attend the three days 11th National Conference of AIDS Society of India that is taking place in Bengaluru. Dr. Naidu, how grave is the problem of TB co-infection in people living with HIV in the current state of affairs? Thank you very much for having me on. In many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of TB patients are co-infected with HIV. At any given time, as from the, the global TB report released in 2018, which gives us data from 2017, there's about 10 million people with tuberculosis. So this is TB disease. We know that there's about 2 billion people that harbor the infection. However, there's just about 10 million that get active disease each year. Of that, 10% of individuals have HIV. Mm -hmm. And that at any given time, you have about 1.1 million people that have both HIV and TB together. About 25% of those patients live in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a huge problem. These patients contribute disproportionately to death uh, among HIV-positive patients and poor outcomes. And TB remains the leading cause of admission from an opportunistic infection globally. Uh, once uh, the UNAIDS Executive Director Michelle Sidby had said that if a virus and bacteria can work together so well, why can't we work together to fight them? So are we really working well at, say, the policy level and community level to get rid of this bacteria virus working together? Thank you very much. I think that's a very important uh, observation. And certainly, uh, with the effort that has gone underway in the last decade, we have far closer alignment and integration of the HIV and TB programs, of the science and the research into TB, in being more inclusive of TB in HIV positive patients um, now than we've been in the past. Certainly, that integration at a policy and at a programmatic level is not, uh, uh, is not the same. It depends on the parts, different parts of the world. It depends on communities. It even depends on facilities. Very often, even back in South Africa, a patient can walk into a health facility and see a doctor for their antiretroviral treatment walk out of the facility, around the building, into another part of the building to access TB services. It would require multiple visits, multiple interactions with various healthcare workers, each one working within their own silos to address their problems that uh, related to either HIV or TB. And um, patients need multiple visits for pull pickup, um, the messages around uh, adherence to treatment are not integrated. The policies and guidelines, while now very much speak to integration, don't completely talk to each other because you could pick up a guideline that uh, speaks to antiretroviral therapy um, and the contents of that guideline doesn't always align very well to TB guidelines. And from a financial perspective, money is generally channeled vertically to a TB program and vertically to an HIV program. You have different custodians of those programs and you have different lines of accountability and reporting. So for true integration to occur, it has to start with the experience that the patient has with the health service. It starts with one patient, two diseases, one healthcare worker, one facility, one roof, one room, one visit to the pharmacy for pull pickup for both diseases, adherence messaging that will target taking pulls for both TB therapy and HIV, diagnostics that speak to both diseases, optimal detection of TB disease in somebody with HIV who does not need as many bugs 
to cause disease and as one who does not have HIV. That speaks to therapeutic guidelines. That speaks to um, the, the way the health system is managed. So um, the insight from Ambassador Sedebe is, is really on point. Um, the, the, there's so much of synergy between HIV and TB in terms of the actual infection with one um, fueling the other that certainly it's a lesson for us all. So uh, the way forward which you have said how the integration should be there, are you experimenting with it in South Africa, it being a high TB as well as a high HIV AIDS burden country? And what are the lessons we can learn from your experiences? South Africa has been truly phenomenal in translating the latest cutting edge evidence into guidelines and policy and quickly implementing those policies to programmatic changes. Certainly within a few months of the WHO announcing the test and treat strategy, South Africa was one of the first to take up that strategy. We were the largest consumers of the um, gene expert machine to enhance diagnosis of TB, especially in patients with um, HIV co-infection because the gene expert test adds about 33% sensitivity and specificity to the traditional smear testing that was in place beforehand. So these are just two examples of the rapid response of policymakers and programmers to emerging evidence that have a major public health impact. Likewise, with programmatic rollout of TB preventive therapy and uh, early antiretroviral therapy in patients with tuberculosis. Caprisa has been uh, at the forefront in interrogating and addressing the programmatic issues that have hampered the integration of HIV and TB treatment. And at the core of it was a physician's confidence in starting antiretroviral therapy during TB treatment. The biggest issue is that patients need to take four TB drugs for two months, two TB drugs for four months, and now you're going to combine it with three antiretroviral agents. These drugs have similar side effects and toxicities. There's issues of pill burden and pill fatigue. The fear of undermining the TB control program and delaying cure in TB patients due to drug interactions. The issues of patients becoming more sick and more dependent on the healthcare system as a result of co-treatment. So the Caprisa research program has systematically addressed each of these issues and have contributed um, a new knowledge to help uh, propel integration, um, the new knowledge around optimal timing of antiretroviral treatment in TB patients, showing a 56% survival uh, a reduction in, in mortality in co-infected patients with early antiretroviral treatment. A, a greater understanding of a phenomenon called immune reconstitution syndrome where patients get sicker before they get better was provided by the study. A very simple uh, understanding that by simply offering TB patients that are HIV positive a CD4 count and antiretroviral therapy you not only um, help with integrating both services, you also enhance retention of TB patients within the TB control program by offering them additional options for caring for themselves. So these studies, uh, including studies on drug interactions, on, um, on switching therapy due to, uh, to pull burden and, and viral failure, etc., have all been published in high-impact peer review journal, journals and have contributed to enhancing integration of TB and HIV care. Recently, South Africa has been again in the forefront of good news. Uh, it has introduced bedaculin in its public health program for tuberculosis treatment. Uh, how is it going to impact uh, people living with HIV who are co-infected with tuberculosis, uh, particularly drug-resistant tuberculosis? And uh, what safeguards are being put into place that bedaculin also uh, does not, be uh, the bacteria doesn't become resistant to bedaculin as well? And is it going to interfere with HIV treatment? India and South Africa together with four other countries hold 60% of the global burden of drug-resistant TB. Um, since, the, uh, but since bedaculin became available, 
South Africa has initiated more than 5,000 patients on bedaquiline. And like drug-susceptible TB patients, HIV, co-infection is extremely high in patients with drug-resistant TB. Bedaquiline use is confined to patients with drug-resistant TB, and it is not offered for patients with drug-susceptible TB. The usual four drug, drug standard TB therapy is offered. Um, the rollout of bedaquiline occurred in a phased approach where um, specific patients that met criteria like harboring strains of um, extreme drug-resistant TB or having complicated multi-drug-resistant TB were eligible for bedaquiline therapy. As uh, evidence became available of the superior efficacy excellent cure and completion rates, as well as lower mortality in patients receiving a bedaquiline-containing com regimen compared to regimen that do not contain bedaquiline. Um, the government has then started rolling out a nine-month regimen, and now f for the last two months, the new WHO guidelines for the management of drug-resistant TB, where all patients now can access bedaquiline. The uh, initial phased approach um, and, and to date occurs such that uh, very senior experienced clinicians are at the forefront of prescribing bedaquiline. There is a, um, a committee that reviews the applications and makes the decisions based on the susceptibility profile of the, uh, of the patient's organism to the TB drugs, as well as what's available and their comorbid conditions. One of the issues that, that you've highlighted already is the drug interactions with the, the specifically the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And so patients that are on antiretroviral therapy uh, are invariably put onto a suitable drug combination so as to not undermine the effect of either the ART or the bedaquiline. Like in any public health rollout of drugs, we would do our utmost to ensure that the lifespan of the drug is sustained for as long as possible to reach as many people as we can. But a lot of drug and pill-taking behavior is dependent on, um, firstly, the patient's behavior in taking the pills as they dosed. Uh, it's supply chain management to ensure uninterrupted supply to patients while they've been given the drugs. It requires uh, suppliers uh, producing the drugs at the levels that's required for each of the countries. Um, there were publications in The Lancet um, that uh, attest to the success of the South African Bedaquiline Access Program, and we remain hopeful um, that it would become a key drug for use in the future. Okay. Uh, what about uh, treatment adherence? Uh, what do you see in your patients? <laughs> I have been to Durban and I was talking to some of the community and they said here uh, tuberculosis has more stigma rather than living with HIV. So do you see any problems of uh, adherence to treatment and is it different in men and women? I being a woman, I'm just interested in that also. Sure. So I could speak to um, adherence to both antiretroviral yes. therapy yes. as well as TB therapy. Mm -hmm. What we do know is, uh, despite having more than 4.2 million people on antiretrovirals in South Africa, <clears throat> the vast majority remain virologically suppressed. Mm -hmm. And viral load suppression rates are a surrogate marker of adherence. Mm -hmm. So uh, despite all the fears, prior to a, a rollout of antiretroviral therapy, we find excellent response from patients in terms of adherence to HIV treatment. A lot of this is due to the availability of one pill once a day, a fixed drug combination. Um, however, I do need to add that if patients get tuberculosis uh, due to drug interactions, uh, um, there is additional dosing required if they're on second-line antiretroviral therapy. Drug-susceptible TB therapy cure and completion rates exceed 85% for South Africa as per the Global TB Report 2018. So we've met the global targets for TB treatment outcomes for drug-susceptible TB. 
The drugs are extremely, again, fixed our combination, one pill. Um, we support directly observed therapy. However, a lot of this doesn't occur in facilities as we simply do not have the healthcare worker resources to support patients, and our burden of TB is huge. Um, so a lot of the community, uh, uh, the support occurs at a community level. The issue with adherence really comes to the fore when you talk about both M, multi and extremely drug resistant TB. And here, the issues are far more complex. Mm -hmm. It's not just related to tablet taking. Mm -hmm. There's the stigma, there's the discrimination, there isn't much support offered to patients at a, at a household and at a community level. There's issue of drug toxicity, which is very disabling. Uh, deafness and, uh, and kidney toxicity are real issues, apart from the fact that these drugs taste awful and they're very difficult to tolerate in the gastrointestinal system due to vomiting, nausea, and in some instances, diarrhea. Other issues like liver toxicity, neuropsychiatric abnormalities are also very real. All of these issues collectively contribute to suboptimal adherence. In the past, we would offer patients intensive treatment mm -hmm. um, where they take the maximum uh, course of drugs uh, under supervision within a f health facility, either a step-down facility or at a, um, at a central facility dedicated to drug-resistant TB. So that uh, helped mitigate the issues of adherence because it's within a facility, it's observed, very often administered by a healthcare worker. Now with decentralized and outpatient access, because we're going towards oral only therapies, um, we need to look at innovative strategies, M Health technology and other strategies to help um, ensure ongoing adherence to patients. Certainly the drugs like bedaquiline has made uh, the therapies far more palatable and tolerable um, and suitable for ambulant care. Um, and decentralized services are now manned with highly experienced healthcare workers that will help support patients. Retention in care is a challenge, especially for males from the work that we've done compared to females. Um, and I think um, bringing in alternate um, or, or um, allied health workers like social workers, mm -hmm. community caregivers, and other very important players within the healthcare se sector to help enhance adherence and enhance uh, retention in care strategies for patients that take these complicated therapies are critically important. I don't think that we can completely medicalize it by getting better drugs. I think it becomes a community responsibility, a community of both healthcare workers as well as civil society. So uh, your take home message, are we on the path to end tuberculosis as well as HIV AIDS by 2030 as the sustainable development goals say? I think it is a tall order uh, to end um, HIV and TB. So the goals uh, ask for a reduction in HIV incidence um, and a reduction in um, AIDS-related death, a reduction in TB incidence and TB-associated mortality. With all the efforts that we have, um, we need to be reducing TB incidence by about 5% per annum and uh, to 2025 and then 10% per annum thereafter for TB. We're nowhere near that. Um, and a lot of this is due to uh, inability to find the missing TB cases that continue to transmit and continue to succumb to mortality. So until we improve our engagement with communities, at patient advocacy, enhance the reach of TB diagnostics into the community, um, we're not going to do enough to curb TB-associated mortality or transmission, which is con contributing to high incidence rate.
TB preventive therapy remains a key goal because HIV positive patients remain a vulnerable pool to acquire TB infection and disease. And TB preventive therapy in vulnerable patients is a key tool to reduce TB incidence. But healthcare workers don't do enough to screen patients for TB and initiate those that screen negative onto TB preventive therapy. So we have tools for diagnosis and we have tools for, um, for um, enhanced um, uh, monitoring of patients and for preventing TB. The problem is when patients do present to health facilities, they present with very advanced disease, and these patients are contributing to the ongoing mortality. So finding diagnostics for the advanced HIV disease, like the urine lamb, mm -hmm. offers a non-invasive op option for patients with low CD4 counts to enhance diagnosis of TB and reduce mortality. For every one day a patient spends in a hospital with undiagnosed TB, their risk of mortality just goes up by more than 30%. So early, early diagnosis and early initiation of treatment is critically important to save TB patients. There's been a huge effort globally on strategies to enhance HIV prevention. Apart from the treatment-related goals of HIV test and treat, there's also a, a the um, WHO guidelines around uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. But despite almost 20 million people being on antiretroviral therapy, the HI there's about 1.8 million people that became infected in 2017 alone. For us to meet the, um, the goals of 1990-90 for HIV, we need to do far more to reduce the number of infections by less than 500,000 per annum by 2020 and less than 200,000 per annum by 2025. So it will require innovative strategies and certainly nothing that we have at the moment seems to be making a difference, either because the uptake has been suboptimal or because the strategies are, are not directly um, getting to those vulnerable to acquiring HIV. So it requires a new ideas and a new way of doing business, fresh approach to vaccines, broadly neutralizing antibodies and other strategies uh, as part of the tools to fight HIV. Thank you very much, Dr. Naidu. Friends, we were listening to Dr. Kogi Naidu, head of the HIV and tuberculosis treatment program at Caprisa, that is Center for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you.